it's a uh, it's a great honor to be here today. Um, it's with a heavy heart. Yesterday, my closest friend went to be with the Lord. He was a giant of a man. He was my roommate for seven years. I left for South Africa several years ago to be a missionary. Brett got married, traded me in for a wife. <laughs> and uh, that's okay because I also found a wife. And... Uh, not from South Africa, though, from New Hampshire. And um, yesterday, his, Brett's wife was down in Bakersfield with her dad, visiting her mom and dad, took her daughter down with her. Uh, she had texted Brett during the day. Brett had not answered. They had talked yesterday morning on the phone and he had just been complaining his back had been sore and all that. And so she texted me at about 8.20 or so last night and asked if I would go over and check. And um, along with his other close friend. So Bill and I went in the door. I'd, I'd lived in the house with Brett for seven years. So I knew the house well. It's right next to where I live. And uh, he was on the floor. probably been there about six or seven hours. Very peaceful expression on his face. I miss my friend. You know, I... Uh, Spent 35 years as a pilot, and you learn as a pilot when you have an emergency, you do the checklist. You don't get emotional. Uh, when you have an engine on fire and you have 226 passengers, it's not time to get emotional or call a committee meeting and look for a therapist. Um, you, you deal in a very professional manner with the emergency. You handle things. Happened to me over 9-11. I, I flew the last American Airlines flight. Uh, on Monday, the 10th of September. And I had flown Flight 77, the one that went into the Pentagon. Uh, I'd flown that flight all the time. If they'd have chosen a different day, they'd have gotten me. Well, I was one of the last guys to see Chick and the, and the crew Monday night. And so when 9-11 happened, I had a co-pilot and nine flight attendants in Long Beach. I had to be there as a pillar of strength for them. And when I got home that Friday is when I uh, had my own personal crash in the presence of God. I walked into church and, and just fell apart. And, um, you know, this morning, you know, I've been there. I've been, I called 911. I, I was the one who called his wife, um, called his brother. And then I came here this morning And the worship was so sweet. I had to leave for a few minutes because his wife had called and asked if I could uh, grab some numbers off of his phone. So I had to run back to the house. I just live on, up on Clinton Avenue. And uh, went back and sat on the sofa and just looked at you know, where, where uh, I found him last night. And uh, so I came back here and the worship was so sweet. And uh, when you get in the presence of God, he melts your heart. I'm just over there crying, blubbering. Um, I tell you what, the worship was sweet this morning, wasn't it? There's something healing about the presence of God. I'm grieving, but not like those who are without hope. Brett is in the presence of the Lord. He is dancing. He is not lobbying God to come back. 
He is dancing with the saints through the ages. I'm down here grieving. I'm rejoicing. When I train wrecked my life 10 years ago through some choices that I made, I lost my marriage because of my choices. Brett is the man who reached out and put his arm around me and nursed me through that triage time. I would not be here today if not for Brett's love and tender affection. Six feet, three inches tall, 265 pounds. Teddy bear. <laughs> I miss my friend. So anyway, you don't know him. You get to meet him in heaven. You get to spend time with him in heaven. And he'll get to spend time with you. I look forward to that. So anyway, that's not about sanctity of human life, but it is. Because you just, you know, you live your life for the Lord. And then when God says it's time to come home, he says it's time to come home. You know, I look at it and I think, wow, there was so much unfinished business. He was 52. Brett and I had plans. We'd built a house together. We had done stuff together. We'd been to, you know, he grew up on a ranch in Montana. We'd been up to his family, Stacia and I, and Brett and Lynn were heading out to the movies this Tuesday night, dinner in the movies together. It's not going to happen. So it seems like there was so much unfinished business. I'm not mad at God. I don't question God's timing or anything. I'm befuddled. Is it okay to be befuddled with God sometimes? I fully trust him. There's no, not a, a moment's hesitation, but that when I see it from God's perspective, I'll know that God took Brett home at the right time for the right reasons, but I'm down here and my heart's bleeding. So as I talk with you, if I get emotional, please bear with me. Uh, I miss my friend. I want to say thank you to Calvary Chapel at Roseville, to Pastor Ken Robillard. Uh, I don't know Ken as well as I would like to, but boy, he's a delightful man. I just, he is just someone, you, you spend time with Ken and you're like, I wish it could have been another hour. I so appreciate his heart for God, his heart for God's word, his heart for God's people, his heart for the lost. Uh, uh, you know, I just, I don't, I don't ever get tired of just sitting down and just hearing his little comments and words of wisdom and his take on things. You, you are blessed to have him as a pastor. Um, Calvary Chapel throughout my lifetime has meant a lot to me. December 26, 1971, I was a 17-year-old senior in high school down in Glendora, California, in the midst of the Jesus People Revival. And there was this church in Costa Mesa, Calvary Chapel, and Chuck Smith. And they loved kids. They loved the hippies. I was probably the only 17-year-old caught up in the Jesus People revival who wasn't a hippie. <laughs> I had already been accepted to the United States Naval Academy. This is as long as my hair's ever been, you know. I stayed away from drugs and sex. Didn't stay away from rock and roll, though. I was a drummer in a garage band. But, uh, but God captured me because I was as lost without Jesus Christ as any hippie. And it was because of the ministry of Calvary Chapel Bible studies that reached up in, even to Glendora and Azusa that God captured me. And I have always had a very fond place in my heart. My brother Dave, who's still down in Glendora, goes to Calvary Chapel, Chino Hills, with Pastor Jack. And uh, he's a character, too. Calvary Chapel, they, you have the most amazing pastors. You really do. I, I love it. But anyway, so I just want to say thank you to Pastor Ken. I want to say thank you to you as a, as a family. Um, because of all the events of, of the last uh, day, uh, I did not get a chance to, here we go. No, there's.
that's not what I want. I'm just, I've got to call it up. I usually print it out and have a nice polished set of remarks and all that, and you're going to get kind of raw from me. But uh, so please bear with me as I find out where I put my PowerPoint presentation. There we go. Could you pop it up on the screen, please? Or do we? There we go. This morning, we're going to talk a little bit about life. It's National Sanctity of Human Life Sunday. It was established by President Reagan. Oh, go right ahead. It was established by President Reagan in 1983, 10 years after the Roe v. Wade decision, January 22nd, 1973. And it was to dedicate the Sunday closest to the day of the Roe v. Wade decision to the sanctity of human life. And so throughout the nation today, churches are gathering together and putting an emphasis on the sanctity of human life, particularly that in the womb, life in the womb. And so I'd like to share with you a little bit this morning about the sanctity of human life, both from a scriptural perspective and from some science. I would like also to share with you a little bit about what our culture, what some of the leading bioethicists and opinion and thinkers in our culture are saying about life in the womb. Because we need to be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. We need to be aware of the way that our culture is approaching this entire issue so that we understand how to connect them with God's heart for life. And so we'll walk a little bit through that, and then I'll talk with you a little bit about Alternatives Pregnancy Center. And on their behalf, I extend to you all of our thanks. Calvary Chapel Roseville has been amazing. And Kathy Cameron, is she amazing or what? Huh? I mean, she just is. Just from coordinating everything to doing the blankets and, and just working with the women here and, and everything else, I just thank you for your passion, uh, just for your heart for Alternatives Pregnancy Center, and uh, just for this family, the entire Chal Calvary Chapel family, for all that you do for us, your prayers, all of the volunteering and the stuff you send to our nursery nook, and for the financial support. We could not do what we do without you. Because when a woman is facing an unplanned pregnancy, she has two questions. Am I pregnant and what do I do? And typically she's not going to go to a church to get an ultrasound, unless you've got an ultrasound machine here or you can do pregnancy verification. She's going to go to a women's health place, most of which are Planned Parenthood women's health specialists that are going to say, hey, easy way out, have an abortion. But when she comes to us, she's coming to us with very real needs. And we have the opportunity of being your missions department to a very important mission field. Because when a woman is facing an unplanned pregnancy, she's open to a lot of things. It's a hard time of crisis in her life. We had a 14-year-old come in three weeks ago, and I could give you story after story after story. Her boyfriend's 17 years old. She's 14 years old. She's pregnant. Uh, at that time, she was about 12 or 13 weeks pregnant. She's 14. She's slim. She doesn't show anything. It's winter. She's scared to even let her parents know. So what do you do in a case like that? We have the opportunity to represent Jesus Christ, his love, his truth, his character to her at a time where she does not know where else to turn because she's scared. She doesn't know what to do. How easy it would be 
for her to walk over to a Planned Parenthood place, and they would say, oh, honey, this is hard. And remember, the women who work as volunteers at Planned Parenthood are not wicked, evil women. They're compassionate women. They don't work there to kill babies. They're there because they care deeply about the mom. Now, they're blind when it comes to the reality that the life in the womb is life created in the image of God with gifts and talents unique in all of history with the call of God upon his or her life. They're blind to that fact. But they're not mean, wicked, evil women. They're women who care. But how easy it would be for them, for her to go to, to Planned Parenthood and they say, oh, honey, you're 14. If you give birth, what you're never going to finish. Look, the, the, the statistics are clear. Your chance of finishing high school is next to nil. Think of the baby. If the baby's born, what chance does the baby have in life? Do the compassionate thing. Have an abortion. You'll be better off. Your baby will be better off. We care about you. Do the compassionate thing. Do you, do you see how that... And yet, God says, that's life created in my image. And so we have the privilege of representing the Lord to this 14-year-old and lining her up with resources because we believe that God can touch that 14-year-old where she is and draw her up and transform her life. And she's not going to get that at Planned Parenthood. She'll get it at Alternatives Pregnancy Center. Now, she needs more than what we have. Our passion for every woman who walks through the door is that she would choose life that she would follow Jesus, and that she would become part of a local church. Now, that doesn't happen with every woman who comes through our doors, but that's our passion. That's what we're working for. That's our goal, because we know that although we have what she needs in that unplanned pregnancy, she needs more than we have. What she needs is a family of God who will rally around her, who will help her in her crisis, to walk through the crisis, to meet God in the crisis, and to let Jesus Christ transform her life. That's our passion. And that's the passion in every client advocate we have who sits down and listens to when that 14-year-old came in and the client advocate met with her and looked her in the eye and said, tell me your story. Do you realize she was the first person that 14-year-old girl had who looked at her without judgment in her eyes. And, you know, we get accused all the time of being judgmental. My heavenly days. I just say to them, if you could become invisible and sit in the room for an hour when our client meet, or meets with the client advocate, and the love in the client advocate's eyes and heart, and says, tell me your story. And the women begin unpacking the hurt and the pain and the fear. And it's, it's, it's an amazing thing. So consider us to be one of your mission fields. So let's get back to the beginning. Now choose life so that you and your children may live. What is our default position at Alternatives Pregnancy Center? Well, it's God's default position. And it's always been God's default position. When in doubt, choose life. I set before you life and death, a blessing and a curse. And then he goes through in Deuteronomy 28, 29, 30, the, you know, the consequences of all, and he says, now choose life so that you and your children may live. And how interesting it is that God did not say, now choose life so that you may live or so that your children may live. Well, that's obvious. If mama doesn't choose life, the, children, the child in the womb doesn't have a say in the matter. The child dies. But God said, choose life so that you and your children may live. Do you know that when we choose death, 
it does not only affect the child in the womb. It affects the mom. It affects the dad. It affects culture. When we live in a culture that so callously chooses death one million times every year, it affects us as a culture. How many women we have had come in who were pregnant and we talk about adoption with them and they say, oh, I could never give up my child for adoption and then they choose abortion. That's a stronghold. When Paul talks about tearing down strongholds, a stronghold is a cultural norm that is antithetical to God, that is against God's view, but it's so strong of a cultural norm that it's what you do without thinking. It's what you believe without thinking. And in our culture today, abortion is considered a form of birth control. They don't even think about it. It's just, you know, well, why not? That's a stronghold. And something that we have learned at Alternatives Pregnancy Center is that you don't tear down strongholds only by giving three points in an hour and this is why there's... No, it takes the Holy Spirit to tear down a stronghold. Strongholds are stronger than we are, but they're not stronger than God. They're not stronger than the power of the Holy Spirit, the transforming presence of God himself. And so when we, when we pour our heart out, when we talk with these young women, we believe that the Holy Spirit is part of every conversation. First woman who came in for Dr. Van to do his ultrasound several years ago, she sat down, or laid, yeah, sat down on, the, on the ultrasound table, and she looked him in the eye and she said, don't even try to talk me out of it. I've already got my abortion scheduled. I just want to know how far along I am. Just very matter of fact. Don't even try to talk me out of it. Dr. Van, okay. So I hooked everything up, and he started doing it, and all of a sudden, up on the screen, she started crying. She said, twins? And she chose life. See, the Holy Spirit just wants to touch them in a very real way at a very critical time in their lives. Now, choose life so that you and your children may live. And if we go to the next one, it just talks about our mission statement at Alternatives Pregnancy Center, reaching pregnant women and those closest to them with God's message of life. Should be the next slide up there. It is. If you pretend, you, you'll see it. <laughs> you know, I, I learned long ago, always give a lot of grace to the audiovisual people because I would be lost up there. And I would have it upside down backwards and in Chinese or something. And they do an amazing job. There we are. Reaching pregnant women and those closest to them with God's message of life. And that is our... our, um, uh, our uh, mission statement. The next one, why are we passionate about life? And that's the answer to that is very easy because God's passionate about life. Some of the scriptures that God has, Genesis chapter one, let us make man in our image, in our likeness. And in chapter two, the Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and the man became a living being. If we have life, anything is possible. If we don't have life, nothing is possible. Is that right? If we have life, anything is possible. If you don't have life, you haven't even made it to the starting line. Nothing is possible. And when God breathed into Adam, he became a living being. Genesis chapter 2, verse 9. In the middle of the garden were the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Did you know that the word life is found in the New International Version more than 500 times? It's at the beginning of the Bible. It's at the end of the Bible. There's waters of life in the river. There's trees of life. 
There's all sorts of stuff about life all throughout the Bible. It is a characteristic of us. We're alive. And so there's the tree of life. And then Deuteronomy chapter 30. See, I set before you today life and prosperity, death and destruction. Now choose life so that you and your children may live. Our nation was founded on a godly understanding of life. You can read it in the Declaration of Independence. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, and that they are endowed by their Creator with certain unalienable rights, and that among these are what? Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Can you get two and three without one? If you don't have life, there's no chance at liberty and the pursuit of happiness. And so if we go on, the question is then, when does life begin? Because a lot of argument in our culture is that, well, it's just really not a human life. And we go through all these mental gymnastics. So if we go to the next slide there, and we ask the question, when does life begin? Well, from if you go online and go to WebMD, you know, it just doesn't get more authoritative than going online. It just doesn't. Because you never find anything inaccurate online. <laughs> no, not. For, this is from the WebMD uh, site. Fertilization happens when a sperm meets and penetrates an egg. It's called conception. At this moment, the genetic makeup is complete. Paul talks about it in Thessalon or in Corinthians when he talks about when you sow the seed. Everything in the oak tree that's 100 feet high and 80 feet wide and all of everything in that oak tree is in the seed that gets planted in the ground. Everything in a human being occurs at the moment of conception. The genetic makeup is complete. And the question is, when does life begin? Right there. At the moment of conception. It goes through a whole lot of stages. It's not viable until maybe the 25th or 26th week. But it's life. And it's no, you were no less you at the moment of conception than you are today. No less. And so if we continue, we read in Psalm 139, for you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place. Jeremiah said, God said to Jeremiah, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. And in Luke chapter 1, when Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leapt in her womb. The word for baby there is the same word that you find in the same gospel, the gospel of Luke, later on when it says, and they brought the babies to him and he laid his hands on them. See, in the Bible, it makes no distinction between the baby in the womb and the babies out of the womb when Jesus laid his hands on them. And Elizabeth says, the baby in me leapt when it heard your voice. So the scripture, you know, we need to understand that you are on solid ground when you have a conversation with someone and they say, well, it's not really human until it's viable. Well, really, tell, how viable is a newborn infant? I mean, let, let, let's be serious. How viable is a newborn infant? You can make its own meals? Is it going to get up and go around? That newborn infant could not survive apart from the mom and the dad. So this, this, this silly talk about viability is really a, 
not accurate. How viable is someone with severe autism who's 22 years old? How do we define viability? And so here we have it. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greetings, the baby leapt in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. She said, as soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leapt for joy. Next is a little bit about science and life. At conception, DNA is formed that's unique in all history. By day 21, the heart begins beating before most moms know they're pregnant. The heart's, it's not even in four chambers yet. It's one chamber. The heart starts beating at day 21 after conception. Week six, brain waves can be measured. Brain cells begin forming beginning in week six all the way to the end of the pregnancy. 100,000 new brain cells every minute. If you find mine, please return them to me. We're still looking for them. <laughs> <laughs> that, that means when mom takes a 10-minute break for lunch, one million new brain cells have formed. And so husbands, when your wife says, I'm hungry, get her something, they're going to the brain cells. Babies begin dreaming at about week 25 or 26. My question, what are they dreaming about? I mean, really, they, you can measure... You have rapid eye movement, and you can measure the alpha waves or whatever they are. Babies dream. Babies show a preference for right or left thumb. By week 16, the baby has fingerprints and toe prints. By week 10 or 12, if the baby's female, she's got the ovaries and <coughs> the eggs for her children. Forming there. Isn't that amazing? I mean, does God know what he was doing or what? The, the, whole, the whole study of fetal development is absolutely fascinating. And it's life. That little munchkin is every bit as created in the image of God as you and I. It doesn't begin when the baby is born. When was Jesus the Son of God in the womb? At the moment of conception. At the moment of conception, he was the Son of God. Nothing changed when he went from inside to outside during birth. He was the Son of God before. He was the Son of God after. You see? And so life begins in the womb. Science is on our side Scripture is on our side. But there are enemies of life. Jesus said the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy, but he came that we may have life and have it to the full. Peter tells us, be self-controlled and alert. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. I took these pictures when I was in South Africa. There's a little, there are a lot of lion parks in South Africa. This was one just outside of Johannesburg. I used to take groups of people in there in my pickup truck, and the lions would jump up in the back of the pickup truck, and they would all go, ooh, you know, just like, just like in America. <laughs> yeah, not. And at one time we had three in the back, and they're all lying down, and I've got, they call a pickup truck a baki, B-A-K-K-I-E in South Africa, and so I've got three lions in the back of the baki, and finally, you know, and they're all, can we move now? And so I let the clutch out and started moving. And there was one male and two family, females, and the male lion lifts his head up and looks in the back window like, don't move. I'm comfortable. I was like, dude, I can't stay here all night. He's like, yeah, you can. <laughs> one time I had, I had, uh, I was taking a group from, from Colorado Springs High School group from Woodman Valley Chapel in Colorado Springs. And, you know, you take four at a time because it's a double cab baki. So I've got my seat. And you drive on the left-hand side of the road, so you drive the steering wheels on the right-hand side. So I had 
uh, 20 kids, so take four at a time. And I had four, four teenage girls with iPhones. And um, <laughs> so one girl's in the seat there and then three in the back seat. And of course, you know, you know, Aslan's in the back and all that. And they're like, this is so cool. And so I'm talking to them. And um, all of a sudden, I felt a paw on my cheek. While I was, here's the steering wheel, and I'm just talking, telling them, okay, everything okay, everything okay. And I'm thinking to myself, maybe not. <laughs> hmm. I had forgotten to roll my window all the way up. <laughs> and so one of the lionesses goes over, jumps up. She's got one paw on the top of the baki, and she's got the, the my, you know, window's about halfway up. Sticks her, she's just... What's in there? Hey, open the door. Let's play. You know? Fortunately, she was not mad. Fortunately, she was not hungry because her claws were sheathed. Even when they're sheathed, she left some scratch marks on my face. And, um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. That too. Um, <laughs> so. The girls are all like, this is so cool. I'm going to post it on Facebook. I'm like, no, 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 no. No, 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 no. You are not going to post it on Facebook. Your parents are watching your Facebook postings. You are not posting this because they're going to open up and there's this park of me. Oh, yeah, that's just the coolest thing. They're going to be like, okay, I sent my daughter to South Africa for this bozo to take them into, I said, no, we, we went back and I apologized to the youth group leader and I said, please forgive me, I put your daughters in danger. I never meant to. Uh, we were, and, and so, you know, he was on the next group and we went in and made sure the window was closed and they all came back up and the female jumps up and looks like, can you roll your window down, please? <laughs> and uh, it was, it, it, lions are amazing. But the devil, you know, it's interesting. God is the lion. Jesus is the lion of the tribe of Judah. The devil's like the, the evil, wicked lion. He goes about prowling. He's about death. He's about destruction. Everything he touches has an air of death in it. And that's true in the area of life in the womb. See, because the devil knows that he cannot assault God with a frontal assault. And I, I need to be over by 11.30? Who's, who do I need to look to for that? Okay. Super. Um, but um, help me, where was I? Pardon? He, frontal assault. The devil knows that he cannot attack God in a frontal assault. So he goes after God through his children. He tries to break God's heart by getting at his children. See, you and I are God's prized possessions. And we've got a bullseye on our because the devil wants to get to the father through the kids. And if he can get to them before the kid is born. Now, here's one argument that I hear. Well, abortion is not even mentioned in the Bible. That's right. Neither is electricity. A lot of things not mentioned in the Bible. They didn't have ultrasounds in the Bible. You know? You got two in your belly, and they're fighting, and each one of them's a nation. A lot of stuff's not mentioned, but you know what is mentioned in the Bible about 20 some odd times? Innocent blood. And there's nothing good that the Bible has to say about the shedding of innocent blood. You're going to get a lot of arguments when you, when you deal with that. And uh, be self-controlled. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. The next segment I have is just some writings from people who are very pro-choice. I'm just going to read a portion of it. 
Mary Elizabeth Williams, last year at Sanctity of Human Life Week, she wrote the following on Salon.com, and this is a quote from it. Yet I know that throughout my own pregnancies, I never wavered for a moment in the belief that I was carrying a human life inside of me. I believe that's what a fetus is, a human life. And that doesn't make me one iota less solidly pro-choice. Okay. In an op-ed on why I'm pro-choice in the Michigan Daily this week, Emma Muneer stated quite perfectly, some argue abortion takes lives, but I know that abortion saves lives too. Interesting. And I would put the life of the mother over the life of the fetus every single time. See, now, why are you making an, e an either-or proposition? I would put the life of the mother over the life of the fetus every time. Okay, would you put the life of the mother over the life of the child every time? I mean, if, if we want to take this to its end, think about it logically, why is it always an either-or proposition? Why is the only solution if, if... Now, if it's an ectopic pregnancy, now choose life so that you and your children may live. Our default position is always life. In an ectopic pregnancy, we risk the loss of life of both mother and child. And if you have the opportunity through surgery to correct that, I don't think anyone has a problem with that because otherwise both are going to die. That's, that's just going to happen. But short of that, why are we making it either or? And then she says, in conclusion, I would put the life of the mother over the life of the fetus every single time, even if I need to acknowledge my conviction that the fetus is indeed a life. And then the last four words on that, a life worth sacrificing. Wow. The baby says, thank you for making that decision on my behalf. A life worth sacrificing. Jesus said, I lay my life down. He didn't say, I lay your life down. I lay my life down for the flock. So that's, that's the thinking that is a stronghold in our culture. And it's a stronghold in, for one reason, because in America today, we value sexual freedom more than we value life in the womb. That's why she is able to say, yes, it is life in the womb. I yield the point, Your Honor. It's life in the womb. And yet I still believe that abortion is the appropriate choice, she says. Why? Because she values sexual autonomy without consequences as more important than life in the womb. And again, that's a stronghold. We need to be on our knees praying for God to help us address that stronghold. I'm going to go on, uh, pop over the next four, and we'll go into abortion statistics. Uh, it's all too common. One out of three, actually, that from the Guttmacher Institute is a 2008. It's, it's now... Uh, the latest I read, 43% of all women have had an abortion by the age 45 in America. And what I would have to say to both the women and the men who have been involved, there is forgiveness in Christ if you are facing the anguish from a prior abortion decision. There is grace, there is forgiveness, there is healing, and there is wholeness to be found in Christ. God wants to touch you. He wants to walk with you through that healing process. You are not a second-class citizen because of a prior abortion decision. We see that all the time. One third of our client advocates, of our counselors, 
Yeah, about 30. Fully one-third of them are post-abortive and have walked through the healing process and know what it's like to have God touch that wound in their heart and turn it into a scar. You know the difference between a wound and a scar? I snapped my Achilles heel in two, my Achilles tendon in two about seven or eight years ago. And uh, Doc had to open up my, the bottom of my leg and pull the top half down, the bottom half up, and sew them back together again. And when he did that, I couldn't touch that without hurting for a long time. I can touch it now. I can step on it. I can bend it. I can do all sorts of crazy stuff with it. The evidence of that snapping will never leave me. That will be with me the rest of my life. But it's no longer... I remember the pain, but it's no longer like that. So it is with the heart. God wants to take that wound and put his healing salve on it and heal it. And then you will have a story to share with others who face similar circumstances. 14,000 abortions every year in Sacramento. That's one every 37 minutes, 24-7. We saw at Alternatives Pregnancy Center last year 1,400 women. It's 10% of the number of abortions. We're just touching the tip of the iceberg. Sacramento Life Center sees about 2,000. New Hope Sierra Pregnancy Center up in Rockland sees about 500 or so. You put us all together, and we see together 4,000. We're just touching the tip of the iceberg. We pray for each other. We work together. The three pregnancy centers, now there's 20-some-odd abortion cent clinics, three pregnancy centers, we are together in this battle. There's no competition. We pray for each other. We do stuff together. I talk with the executive directors, the other two. I bless them, pray for them, and uh, we, we're in this together. Uh, let's go on to the Leaning Tower of Pisa. When the foundations are being destroyed, what can the righteous do? The answer cannot be nothing. So when the foundations of a culture are being attacked and destroyed, God sets up a plumb line. And Calvary Chapel Roseville is one of those plumb lines. God sets it up as an example. No, this is how you deal with a situation where a 12-year-old walks in and she's pregnant. Yes, we've had a 12-year-old walk in and yes, she was pregnant. This is how you deal with it when you have a 23-year-old woman walk in and she says, you don't understand, if I don't get an abortion, I will lose my job. And the client advocate says, tell me your story. And it turns out she's a dancer at an adult club in downtown. Now you understand why she's afraid of losing her job. I'm interested. How did, tell me your story. How did you get into that line of work? She begins opening her heart up. Oh. Turns out her boyfriend wants her to quit the job. Yeah. Her boyfriend wants her to choose life. She was afraid she ended up choosing life. Quitting the job, choosing life. Now, in this particular case, four months later, she miscarried. The grief of a miscarriage is categorically different than the grief of an abortion. Categorically different. That's true with the hardest cases. People say, well, what about abortion in the case of rape and incest? That's been the death knell for a couple of Republican candidates in the 2012 election cycle when they were asked that question. But here's the reality. Number one, as a guy, I cannot begin to imagine the horror that a woman goes through, the trauma that she goes through in a case of rape. Outside of murder, it's the vilest, most despicable crime I can imagine. And my heart goes out. We have one of our client advocates who had an abortion because of rape. 30 years ago. So I, as a guy, I can't even begin to imagine the horror that a woman faces. And the anger that I have towards the guy who would do that. But why would anyone ask my opinion? How about asking the opinion of women 
who have conceived because of rape and incest. And there have been studies done on that. And did you know that in all three studies that I have read, beginning in 1979, tracing women who have conceived because of rape and incest, 70% of them chose life. And in the questionnaires, they were asking them, well, wasn't it hard because now you're thinking this is the product of rape? And they said, yes, it was. It was horrible at the beginning. The only redeeming thing was the birth of the baby because it's not his baby. It's my baby. Every bit as much. And that the birth that came out of that thing, that which, as Joseph said to his brothers, that which you meant for evil, God made for good. The women who gave birth as a result of conceiving from rape and incest, they say it was the only redeeming thing out of it, and they are glad 100% of them, if had to do it again, would choose life. The 30% who chose abortion, it's actually a little less than 30 because 5% miscarried, and, and the studies were fairly consistent between all three. The 30% who chose abortion, 80% of them regretted their decision to abort. What they said was now I had two violations to, to, to process through, the rape and the abortion. 80% of them wished they had chosen life. Those are hard cases, but we cannot be afraid. If God cannot meet us in the hard case, then we're in the wrong religion. But Jesus, Jesus delights in redeeming. He delights in healing. He delights in coming to where we are and wrapping his arms around us and saying, I'm going to make all things new. He does that. We see that all the time at Alternatives Pregnancy Center, and I'm running out of time. So I'm just going to go real quickly. When the enemy comes in like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord lifts up a standard against him. And that's what he does with pregnancy centers. Pregnancy centers are a standard in the midst of a culture that does not value life in the womb. And let's go on. Why pregnancy centers? Because the need is desperate. Our impact. I'm just going to rip through this real quick and get to the end. 1,403 client visits last year. 663 pregnancy tests. 339 ultrasounds. Parenting classes. 61 opportunities. We always present the gospel. Our view is that of... I don't know if it was St. Francis of Assisi or St. Someone of somewhere else. But he said, preach the gospel at all times, and when necessary, use words. See, we preach the gospel every time a woman comes in. She's not coming in to meet with God. She's coming in because, am I pregnant? What do I do? But God is waiting to meet with her. And so we get the opportunity to extend the love of Jesus Christ to them. And they come back because they, they sense it. They walk out and they go, something's different about here. Opportunities present. Most women who visit Alternatives Pregnancy Center are not churchgoers. They come in a time of crisis. We represent Jesus. We're an extension of your passion for missions. Uh, areas of ministry, areas of emphasis for 2015, launching a mobile clinic, and uh, what I'd like to just end with is, is, is this. What can I do? If you go to the, to the, uh, uh, the area that, that says, what can I do? Yeah, there's our mobile clinic. And we're in health fairs, community colleges, there we are. What can I do? It all begins with healthy, godly families. The best thing you can do to support us is to follow Jesus with a whole heart. That's the best thing you can do. Follow Jesus with a whole heart because God will place you in the body of Christ with your gifts and talents in such a way that you will have maximum impact in spreading his love to a culture that's starving for it. It might not be in supporting Alternatives Pregnancy Center. It might be in some other aspect of God's heart for the world. But the best thing you can do to support APC is to follow Jesus with a whole heart, to have, be part of a godly family. Whatever your past is, is your past. It's never too late 
to do the next right thing. It's never too late to walk with God today. And God, who knows exactly where to place everyone in the local church and in the universal church, knows exactly how to address every stronghold in our culture. And so whatever your place is, you follow that with a passion, and God will use you to touch the world around you. It's the first thing you can do to help us. Follow Jesus with a whole heart. Begins with healthy, godly families. If you have children, have age-appropriate conversations with your children about every topic that interests God. If it interests God, talk to your kids about it. Because they're already hearing stuff about sexual uh, values, about abortion, about this and that and the other stuff in, in, in school. And if you homeschool them, which is awesome, they're hearing about it elsewhere. They don't live in a vacuum, and you do not want them to live in a vacuum. Because when they finally grow up and leave home, they've got to live in the culture. And so we want to equip them, equipping the saints to do the work of the ministry. God has a call on your children's lives, so have age-appropriate conversations with them about all of these various topics. They're hearing it, and be active in the life of your local church. Because God leverages our influence together, individually, into the influence that a local church has. Calvary Chapel Roseville has an impact that is greater than the sum of each one of you. Each one of you individually has an impact in your sphere. But Calvary Chapel Roseville has an impact that goes beyond that because of the unity and the focus on Jesus and the presence of God here. Calvary Chapels worldwide has an influence that is phenomenal. And so be part of a local church. That's how you can help us. The other three things, pray, volunteer, and give. Whether it's financially and again, whenever we talk about finances, your first obligation financially is the tithe and offering to the local church. Never give to Alternatives Pregnancy Center or any other organization except on top of what you give to the local church. It's God's design. It's a beautiful design because God's got the resources. We have financial needs. It's been a very, hor not horrible, it's been a very challenging year financially. We bought the van. That took a lot. We're trying to open it. But you know what? I believe God's got the resources. So when I, when I ask for support from pastors and from churches, I don't go, we're going we're gonna to fold up if you don't. No, 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 no. We get to share together in reaching. We have very real financial needs. So does the local church here. Be a giver. And you know why? Because God's a giver. When we give, we're expressing God's DNA. God's always, he was a giver before Genesis 1-1. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit gave and served one another, gave to one another and served one another long before time ever began. When Jesus came to serve, that was not a new skill set for him. He already knew how to serve. He didn't have to learn how to serve when he became flesh and blood. He did not have to learn how to give when he gave, became. When, when God says, when Jesus said, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, giving comes naturally to God. Always has and always will. Same with us. Volunteer, financially, upcoming events. The, I didn't bring a bottle up, but we've got uh, some bottles here for a Bottles for Life campaign. One of the ways that you can help us is to take a bottle with you, and are we doing them now or are we doing them later? I think you said March? Yeah, okay, it'll be March. So I'll give, this is two months in advance. When, when we hand them out, you take the bottles home with you, you put change in them. If you run out of change, don't worry, pull your wallet out and throw some bills. If you have any ones, throw, if you run out of ones, don't worry, throw a five in. If you run out of fives, throw tens in. If you, run, if you don't have any cash, throw a check in, okay? But uh, seriously, just, you know, it's an opportunity. And whenever you see the bottle, pray for us. That's the most important thing you can do because we need the Spirit of God in every conversation that we have. And we have 120 of them every month with a client. 
And if, if it, you know, it's dove or duck theology. If the dove doesn't show up, we're a dead duck. And so we covet your prayers. And um, we've got a walk coming up, Walk for Life, Saturday, May 16th at Maidu Park. We've got a gala coming up, October 2nd. Just a, a lot of things. Go to our, our Facebook site and uh, just see what we're doing when you, you know, like it, share it, do whatever. Uh, pray for us whenever you're on our Facebook site. But in conclusion, I thank you for your prayers. I thank you for your involvement. I thank you for your patience, because I, I did go long, and I apologize for that. Uh, but I hope you hear God's heart for the unborn. And could we share together in that? So let's close in prayer. Father, thank you for this wonderful family. Thank you for what you're doing here at Calvary Chapel Roseville. Continue to build your kingdom here in the lives of everyone. We pray for Pastor Ken as he's out today with his friend. God, be with him. Let it be a joyful time. We pray for, for Lynn, who is coming home in the wake of her husband's death. God, would you be with her? Would you wrap your arms around her as we celebrate the 52 years that Brett did walk this earth. He's with you now. And we thank you, God, for your love and for your grace. In Jesus' name, amen.